welcome everybody to six tips to support your first year as a newly registered nurse. I work really closely with newly registered nurses and I know how difficult that transition period can be. So hopefully you'll find some of these tips helpful. You've had to go through a pandemic, lots of other placement issues. So well done all of you. You're probably either a student near to registering or a newly registered nurse. So hopefully you'll find some of these tips helpful. So my first key tip is don't try to do too much when you first start as a newly registered nurse. Many newly registered nurses I talk to feel overwhelmed. They feel they should know more than they should. They put pressure on themselves and you're not alone. And actually experienced nurses when they start a new role will often do that as well and feel they should know more than they do when you shouldn't. Managers don't expect it, educators don't. And it takes time to develop your confidence and those key transferable skills during your first year. And it's not a race. It can take two, three, four even years for you to really consolidate your learning from your degree. And just don't put that additional stress on yourself. Try and break your learning down into achievable goals and focus on one thing at a time and utilise the support in your area to um, managers, educators, preceptors to focus your learning down. One thing I did when I was a nursing sister on um, a neurology unit, I would sit with the new starters, get them to reflect on patients that they'd cared for the previous week, what areas they were interested in, but get them to focus on one area, but always use a person centred approach. Um, often they would try and look at all the anatomy and physiology and want to know about uh, the brain, the spine, the investigations. But if they come from a patient centred approach, it slows your learning down. Go and sit with your patients, ask them how they've been affected by epilepsy, for example. This is the one example I'll use, um, but it could be transferable to any field of nursing. Um, looking for uh, biopsychosocial needs, holistic aspects of care, how it's affected that individual. Um, and then you can start looking at the medications, what led them to come into hospital, the investigations, and the classification of seizure then can be linked to your patient. Some patients have an aura before they have a seizure and have different types of seizures. And if you use a person centred approach to break your learning down into achievable goals, it will slow your learning down. But you will remember because you'll remember it linked to your patients or clients, if you prefer to use that term. And remember, your health always, always comes before work, which is why you should not try to do too much. And to. <coughs> Second key tip, understanding key structures. When you first start, when you're in your induction period or your supernumerary period at the beginning, it's really helpful to um, download. You, you might have some visuals linked to clinical education structures and the management structures. Human resources, that's another line of support that you can access. And if you know what the structures are, and for example, your line manager's not there, or they might be off sick, then who do you go to next? And so that you've always got somebody you can access for support. And if you want to go out of the area, you might have um, freedom to speak up guardians. There may be preceptorship leads or university leads or a recruitment lead that you can go and talk to. And if you've got those ready there, if you need them, then that's fantastic. It's also important to understand the roles within the clinical setting that you're working in. You'll have key experts, clinical governance leads, safeguarding leads, people that are advanced nurse practitioners and experienced nurses. And you can utilise all of those skills, multi-professional, um, allied health professionals and utilise that support there. And it's helpful to know what they do in their roles. When you're a lot of newly registered nurses, when I do action learning sets or sit and reflect or do some clinical supervision, the key things they worry about are documentation, delegating, accountability in case they miss escalating um, 
a, a serious incident, for example, and but it's the delegation and documentation they really worry about and their accountability. So uh, another key thing to do linked to this tip would be to go and look at your clinical support workers or health and social care workers. They will usually be a band two or a three. And what do they what can they do? What tasks can you delegate to them? And it can be different because health and social care workers and support workers um, would usually do a care certificate, but some may not have the care certificate. They might do national vocational qualification. They might do level two, three, four health and social care support co courses or uh, previous apprenticeships. And it's really helpful for you, while you're in your induction period to find out what competences they have or proficiencies that they have and the roles from support worker to registered nurse. So you've got assistant practitioners, nursing associates only in England currently and um, that are registered with the Nursing and Midwifery Council and knowing what the roles are between support worker and registered nurse and what they can do is going to help you with your decision making and will help with your delegation as well. Post registration, education and applying for funding. I've done a video on um, accessing an overview, sorry, of post registration education that talks about structures as well. So that might be quite helpful. I've also got a video on the differences, a short video on the differences between a support worker, assistant practitioner, nursing associate and registered nurse that you might find helpful as well. Third tip, accessing support, so important. Never be afraid to access support from your line manager. If you don't feel comfortable going to a line manager, you can go to a clinical educator, wellbeing lead, recruitment, workforce leads, human resource advisors, and you might also have peer support groups for newly registered nurses. We've also got national social media, Facebook forums, Twitter forums. You've got the um, newly registered nurses network with the Royal College of Nursing. They're a fantastic group to access. Um, and there's you know, the Royal College of Nursing unions. You've got Unison, other nursing uni unions as well. Um, and, and do access support because life is just too short to spend eight to 12 hours a day unhappy at work. So if you need additional support, speak to someone if you need help and access that support. And it's all of our responsibilities to look out for each other. You know, you might find a doctor in an office that's really upset about something or somebody from the multidisciplinary team a cleaner, it could be anybody, but we should all be looking out at supporting each other. Fourth one, prioritise essential learning. When you first start, you'll be bombarded with e-learning and um, you'll be given, you know, sent stuff at inductions and on preceptorship and different schedules. The key thing is to um, ask for advice if you feel you are becoming overwhelmed. You'll have inductions that will be corporate led inductions where, for example, you might get your security cards and have some advice when you first come to a trust, for example, or an institution. Specialist orientations from in the local area that you're working and clinical supervisors that will be should be giving you professional development reviews clinical support there may be there should be preceptorship so um, as a newly registered nurse you should be allocated a preceptor and there may be local preceptorship programs and you need to find out about this you know when, when you first start but you'll have statutory training which is defined by national health and safety and laws national laws and there is mandatory training that's compulsory and so statutory mandatory training, it should always be prioritised and it will be determined by your employer if it's mandatory training and it will be based on your nursing responsibilities and your job description. So that's th that, that would be the first little bit of training, not a little bit because there's quite a lot of e-learning, but um, the first bit of training and development that you need to focus on. Then you can look at more longer term learning and development and be led by your manager and your educator through professional development reviews. 
uh, one area, as I did mention earlier, newly registered nurses worry about escalation. So one area that you can do is look at your policies for escalation, risk assessments, mental health, the Mental Capacity Act and doing mental health um, assessments, deprivation of liberty. Um, and looking at risk assessments in the area that you work, that's really helpful on induction. And equipment, there may be equipment training, medication you can link into the pharmacists. In the area, they can usually give you a printout of medications used regularly in the area, for example. Or if there's policies linked to pharma pharmacy, you can link in with the pharmacist. And patient information, a lot um, of newly registered nurses I talk to worry about the information they're giving patients, say, for example, on discharge, or they're trying to explain an investigation that's going to take place or the support that's needed. And what's helpful sometimes is to look at patient information leaflets, actually, when you first start in an area, because the patient information leaflets if you if somebody's going for an MRI scan, a magnetic resonance imaging scan, if you've got the information leaflet and you're a bit underconfident about going through, that there's a sound like a sledgehammer, you might feel a bit um, claustrophobic. If you go through using a patient information leaflet, you can download them from NHS websites as well, then that will guide you with what you're saying to your patient and you won't be worrying that you've said the wrong thing. There's little tips like that that will help. So look at what documentation and patient information resources there are in your area. And as I said earlier, you'll be led by your managers and your educators as well to prioritise your learning. Number five, don't compare yourself to others. Everyone does it. I don't tend to do it now. I'm in my 50s. I'm too old. Um, to be comparing myself and I think if people don't like me as a person or my approach or my personality that's absolutely fine I'm not everybody's cup of tea by any means but um, you are you have your own learning and development needs and we are all different and we should all embrace different strengths areas for development and we will be different to other staff and we should all be respectful of that I remember as a dissertation supervisor, lots of students would talk to a other student and then they'd come in and say, oh, I don't think I'm far enough ahead or I'm, um, I should be doing this. And it would be like, no, this is your dissertation and you go at your own pace. And it's the same when you register. So if you see somebody doing something and you think, oh, I should be doing that and I don't feel that I'm far enough ahead, try not to be hard on yourself. You, you need to go at your own pace. And it's not, as I said earlier, it's not a race. Regular professional development reviews, appraisals and constructive feedback from others will really help your development. And I try and try and get your professional development reviews or PDP. They sometimes call them professional development plans every three months. So you can sit down with your line manager or an educator and have some constructive feedback on your progress and it will inform future plans. And it might be that you can access some local study days and courses in the future as well. So it will help guide your future learning. Appraisals are usually at one year. But that constructive feedback should be ongoing. So on it, every time you work, there should always be somebody you can go to. So, for example, if you did have to fill in an incident form, you could ask somebody to have a look at it for you. And what do you think? And it's really helpful to book in those professional development reviews in advance in managers or whoever's going to do your review, your team leader or um, an educator, so that it's in the diary and be proactive, because obviously with the pandemic, people are all really busy. And the reality, I work clinically still um, on occasion and I know what the reality is and what it's like. And that reviews can sometimes be cancelled. But if it's in the diary, it's, you know, it will be helpful. And if and, and you try and have a team of people to give you constructive feedback of experienced nurses as well, which is helpful. And your development plans should be individualised to you. And lastly, use available resources. And it sounds simple, but not everybody does access the support that's out there. 
and find out who you, the specialist nurses or advanced nurse practitioners are in your area, the pharmacists, clinical academics and researchers and clinical governance leads, you librarians you can still you can network you might be lucky if you in a big trust for example that you've got a healthcare library there's nothing stopping you accessing local healthcare libraries and university libraries um, researchers and that there's also a lot online that you can access Athens and a lot of employers will have online library networks that you can still link to to gain evidence-based practice if you're looking into an area in practice, for example, clinical governance leads, junior and experienced staff. So somebody that's been through their first year as a newly registered nurse might have some really good tips to help you. And patient information leaflets, as I mentioned, and the intranet for aspects of care. And that's something that you can, the evidence base underpinning your care. And it's something you can do on your inductions and you might have some simple overviews of key conditions, treatments, investigations that you can use as a template when advising and developing care plans for patients. But see what's out there and access, go through clinical educators and all of the people network with key professionals. And you've got national links and national forums you can link with too. So we're at the end now, you'll be pleased to know. So um, I hope those six tips help you. If you've got any questions or comments, let us know how you're getting on. And um, if you do want to contact me, you can contact me on my website or on Twitter or Instagram, you can DM me. And I really hope you're okay, that you, you take your time. And if you need extra support, access that support. And good luck during your first year and for the rest of career.